turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. Those of you who are visiting this morning, again, welcome. We have been going through a study on the life and ministry of the prophet Elisha. And uh, last time I was with you, we uh, were in chapter 5. We are going to be in chapter 5 yet again. Uh, last time we uh, studied a very... Uh, interesting man, a very profound uh, story, actually. His name was Naaman, and Naaman, we read, was a very great man uh, who ended up being healed by the touch of God upon his life. He had a great uh, position. He was the commander of the uh, army of Syria. He uh, had great power. He had uh, great uh, prestige. Uh, the people lauded him. He had great prosperity as he thought that he could actually purchase the grace of God and the mercy of God upon his life and found out that that doesn't work. That's not the way it has worked. Uh, it never has. It never will. And so uh, he came to uh, Israel, this uh, Syrian commander and uh, sought to be healed by the prophet Elisha. And uh, as we read the story and as we covered this, we saw that uh, Elisha uh, told Naaman to go to the Jordan River and to dip himself seven times. And of course, the number seven in scripture is the number of completion. And so he did this. And we talked about also how this, in, in many ways, is a picture of water baptism. Uh, he went to the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, where John the uh, Baptist had his ministry of baptism and repentance. And of course, the Apostle Peter told us in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for, who, and for all who call upon the name of the Lord. And so uh, after some reluctance and some people speaking into his life, we always need people who will speak into our lives. Naaman went and he was uh, there at the Jordan and he dipped himself seven times and he was healed and whole, made whole and he was restored and we talked about how really this is an Old Testament picture of salvation in the New Testament, how we have to come to an end of ourselves we have to come to a place of realizing that God is our only answer, that God is our only hope, like Naaman we must be desperate Come to God and we must repent of our sins and we must be <clears throat> baptized in water and it's there that we will find the grace and the touch of God upon our lives and so though David was a great man uh, he also had a great problem and that is he was a leper and we talked about how leprosy throughout the scripture oftentimes reflects Sin, the symbolic of sin in people's lives. And he was in a situation that the world had no answer for him. So he went to the God of Israel, to God's prophet, Elisha. It's there that he received the mercy and the grace of God that he so desperately needed. Now, this morning we are going to be in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 again. <clears throat> we are going to be talking about the tale, T-A-L-E, of two servants. And one of the servants that we are going to be looking at is Elisha's servant, and that is the servant Gehazi. We have uh, already talked about him uh, a, a little bit. He will come back into the story again later on. And then we are going to talk uh, a little bit this morning about Naaman's servant, a servant girl, and we're going to see the differences in each of their lives and where their paths took them. And so we are going to <clears throat> pick up this morning in chapter 5. 
verse 15, and then we're going to backtrack a little bit and uh, look at the first part of the chapter as well. <clears throat> verse 15. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so please take a present from your servant now. And so this is Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, who uh, was a leper and was healed as a result of, of uh, baptized, being baptized there in the Jordan River. And uh, he's now declaring that, that, that there is only one God, and that is the God of Israel. And uh, he wants Elisha to take a present. Remember, he brought about three and a half million dollars with him on this trip uh, to uh, pay for his healing, and Elisha refused it then. And as we're going to read, he refuses it here. But he, he said, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand, this is Elisha speaking, I will take nothing. And we talked about the reason why is because salvation is free. Uh, salvation is Jesus plus nothing. Any other equation is bad mathematics, all right? Jesus plus nothing. I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, that is Naaman is urging Elisha, but he refused. He wasn't a hireling as some are, verse 17. Naaman said, if not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt Offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Remember, he's from Syria. They worship idols. They worship false gods. And uh, he had made a pledge that he would worship no other god. Verse 18. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. We all need forgiveness for worshiping false gods before coming to, to Christ. He says, when my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, his master was the king of Syria, and he leans on my hand, he needed help, apparently he was old and fragile, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, or Rimon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And he said to him, Elisha said to Naaman, go in peace. And so he departed from him some distance. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Armenian, the Syrian, by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw one running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, That is Gehazi, all is well. My master, that is Elisha, has sent me, saying, Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, be pleased to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them to, to, a, 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 to of his servants and they carried them before him. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and deposited them in the house. And Gehazi sent the men away, and they departed. But he went up and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. And then he said to him, that is Elisha to Gehazi, do not, did not my heart go with you? 
when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. A very, very powerful and profound and sobering story here when it comes to the servant days of. Notice the destructive path that he took. And notice uh, his downfall as a result of wrong decisions that he made. First of all, I want you to notice how Gehazi left his post. Look with me again, verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Arminian. Give me one moment. <clears throat> By not receiving from his hands what he bought, as the Lord lives, I will run after him. I'm going to ask uh, Joseph, could you get me uh, the stool that's in the, in the back and the uh, music stand? I'm going to need uh, to sit down here in a moment. <clears throat> so it says, basically, I'm going to go A W O L. I'm going to be away without leave. And this is what happens when we lose sight of our calling. And that is our eyes get fixed on worldly things rather than godly things, and off we go. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me, I've been, uh, I think there's a stool. And I'm going to ask uh, somebody to help uh, Joseph move this over. Actually, I just really want to be like Daniel. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I, uh, I have bronchitis or walking pneumonia or some type of uh, ailment that doesn't seem to want to uh, want to leave, so you're going to have to, to bear with me uh, this morning. So, <coughs> Gehazi goes evil. And Gehazi, he was drawn to something that really would be his demise and would destroy his destiny. Uh, instead of being about his father's business, he leaves his post. And he pursued something that <clears throat> he really had no business pursuing. And again, this is what happens when we lose sight of our call. And we chase after things like fame and fortune and fleshly desires. Guys, listen. When we convince ourselves that the kingdom of this world is more satisfying than the kingdom of God, we cross a line where there may be no turning back. Elijah's 
speaks to his servant Gehazi. And he discovers by a supernatural revelation of God that he had went able, that he had left his post. Number two, <clears throat> the second thing that Gehazi does as a result of things that were going on in his life is that he longed for the things of this world. <clears throat> you see, Gehazi, he struggled with grief. He also struggled with the sins of envy and lust, which are its cousins. Now, lust, as we all know, usually wants everything now. As a matter of fact, I think it's safe to say that lust is the most impatient of all sin. Envy wants that which doesn't belong to us. And greed, it's really the combination of the two. It's the combination of lust and envy working together. And so greed is the crossroads where envy and lust meet. We want something and we want it now. And it gives birth to grief. And this is where Gehazi finds himself at in the story. <clears throat> Why did he get me some more uh, food? And so, for definition's sake, envy, there's none of that. Have to make some little honey. <laughs> and with your sweetness, it will just, it'll just be wonderful. So for definition's sake, envy wants more than what we have. Have you been there? Have you done that? Greed wants more than what we need. Have you been there? Have you done that? You know, that scripture actually tells us that greed is a form of idolatry and can actually cause a person to spurn God and curse God. Thou shall not covet. Covetousness is really the root cause of greed, isn't it? And of course, the reason why we get to this place is because God yes. God won't always give us what we want when we want it. But what we fail to remember is that He will always give us what we need when we need it. And so <clears throat> what do we do when we find ourselves battling with these things? Well, things like lust, things like envy, things like greed and jealousy, and you can add to the list, they all can be conquered by one thing. They all can be conquered by one virtue, and that is contentment. Could you say that word out loud with me? <laughs> Gehazi, you see, wasn't content with what he had where he was at in life. And listen, it became his downfall. And so Gehazi, he comes to, again, this crossroads where lust and envy meets and it gives birth to grief. And so what does he do? <clears throat> Gehazi, we are told, literally ran after Naaman and his wealth in verse 20, and this, of course, is a picture of how we can oftentimes run after the things of this world. There's a couple verses I would like you to read out loud for me on your screen. We can go ahead and turn there, 1 John. 
chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Would you save my breath for me and read these out loud? Beginning. Do not love this world. in all kinds of forms. All kinds of packages. You see, it always longs for what isn't ours, and it always longs for more than what we need. And so we are really posed with an important question, and it's this. Are we going to run after God, chase after God, or are we going to run after the things of this world and chase after the things of this world? Gehazi did not desire God's best. He desired the world's best. What the world hath had to offer, and that is the temptation that each of us faces each and every day. Now let me just tell you <coughs> what is so sad about this this story is this. Gehazi, he saw and he experienced God in ways that others were not privileged to see or experience. Remember who he is. He is the servant of Elisha, arguably the greatest prophet to ever live. <clears throat> he heard things that others didn't hear. He was privileged to see things that others didn't see. He was privileged to see more than what others saw. And Gehazi is an Old Testament type of Judas. Because Judas you see, did the same thing. Judas heard things that others didn't hear. He saw things that others didn't see. He lived with Jesus for three years. <clears throat> Just like Gehazi lived with Elisha. And what did Judas do? Despite it all, he stole money from the money box. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And just like Judas, Gehazi was filled with grief. What is also sad is that it appears to me anyway that God intended Gehazi to be to Elisha what Elisha was to Elijah. Gehazi was in an internship program. You see. Just like Elisha was a servant to Elijah. Gehazi was a servant to Elisha. And where Elisha passed the test with flying colors, Gehazi failed miserably. It's all based upon decisions that we make in regard to our lives and the bad decisions that Gehazi made that led to his downfall was that he left his post. Has God called you somewhere? Has God called you to do something? Don't leave your post. Number two, he longed for the things of this world more than he longed for the things of God. Number three, he lied 
to cover his tracks. We read in verse 22 that he lied to Naaman. He told Naaman that Elisha sent it. That's a bold face lie. And then he comes back and he lies to Elisha. Elisha said, where have you been? Well, I, I didn't know anything. <laughs> kind of sounds like a story in the garden, doesn't it? You see, <clears throat> Gehazi lied to Naaman, and Gehazi lied to Elijah, and guess what? He lied to himself as well. And it's usually when we lie to ourselves that we start lying to others. It's a very simple progression. He lied to himself because he said to himself, as the Lord lives. You see, Gehazi had no business mentioning God's name in this scheme of his. God had nothing to do with it. Gehazi was trying to spiritualize his fleshly actions. In Gehazi's mind, God must have owed him. And so he tries to justify his actions, you see, and that required him to lie to himself. And that's what people do when they try and justify their sin. They listen. They have to to lie to themselves or the guilt becomes too great to bear. And I've discovered that those who speak a lie are usually those who live a lie. Let's thank my lovely wife, shall we? <laughs> Did you forget the lobster tail? <laughs> I'm going to get her back to this. <laughs> Pray for me, not for my sickness, but for my future well-being. <laughs> Those who speak a lie usually live a lie. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. And so instead of staying under Elisha's covering, Gehazi was satisfied with a cover up. He covered up his lust. He covered up his envy. He covered up his greed with a lie. And the question that we always have to ask ourselves is, do you want to cover up or do you want to cover in? Which one is it going to be? Do you want to walk under God's covering, a covering of love that tells us it covers a multitude of sin? Or are we going to try to cover up? Gehazi was involved in a great cover-up, but it didn't work. And so, because Gehazi left his post, because he longed for the things of this world, because he lied to cover his tracks, he eventually lost God's faith. We read in verse 27 that he was struck with leprosy. He was struck with leprosy. <clears throat> you know, in Luke chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus spoke these sobering words. He says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, that is the things of this world, worldly things, worldly possessions, worldly wealth. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And of course, the true riches speaks of the things of God's kingdom, doesn't it? The things that are truly valuable, the things that are truly precious. You see, loved ones, please hear this. If God can't even trust us to handle our finances in a righteous manner or to tithe 
or to be good stewards of our possessions. Listen, why would he entrust something to us like revival? You see, if he can't trust us to be faithful in unrighteous wealth, how can he entrust us with the true riches of his kingdom? And how we handle the one unrighteous wealth is a reflection, guys, of how we will handle the other. Make no mistake about it. Because we will see them one and the same. We will think in our minds, wealth is wealth. And if we discard and if we mistreat that which is unrighteous, how much more will we treat that which is righteous in God's kingdom? Well, this is, this is a sobering story. This is a profound story. Gehazi so desperately wanted what Naaman had, didn't he? And so guess what? He ended up with what Naaman had. Leprosy. He got the whole kit and caboodle. And this is a vital and sobering truth that we would do well to realize. Please, everyone hear this. When we run after the things of the world, we may indeed get what we are running after. We may indeed accumulate wealth or fame or power or fortune or popularity or whatever, but listen. We not only miss out on the true riches of God, the true riches, but we also get everything else that goes along with those worldly things, just like Gehazi did. You see, wealth or fame or popularity or relationships or whatever it is, isn't all that it's cut out to be. So... Let us be careful what it is that we long for, what it is that we run after in this world, because listen, you might just get it. And when you get it, you also get all the other things that come along with it. And so, Gehazi is a man <clears throat> who made destructive choices for his life, and they resulted in his downfall. He lost, or he left his post. He longed for the things of this world. He lied to cover his tracks. He lost God's favor, but we discover another servant in this story, and it's in the first part of chapter 5, in this tale of two, two servants, and it's the servant of Naaman, this servant girl, and she's yet another unnamed hero in the Bible. And we read that she was a captive. Some people came into uh, Israel from Syria and they took her captive. They kidnapped her. But she didn't let her circumstances make her bitter. She didn't live like a victim. Instead, she sought to make other people's life better, despite her predicament. She lived to be a blessing even in the midst of her captivity. Look with me in verse 1 of chapter 5. <clears throat> it says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, Syria, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given him victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now, the Arminians had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, speaking of Elisha. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel, then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed 
and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. Again, this is about three and a half million bucks of stuff. He brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, and now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive? that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy. But consider now and see now he is seeking a quarrel against me. And in verse 8, it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And, of course, we studied Last time we were together about how uh, uh, Naaman was cured as he went to the Jordan River. We talked about that already. But we discovered that where one person, because of his decisions, had a great downfall, someone else had a great promotion. This servant girl, who was unnamed, was really promoted and used greatly in the kingdom of God. She may not have been promoted in the world, as you would have it, but she was, and she did experience promotion in God's kingdom. And there's three things, I believe, that led to her promotion. The first is this. She had a great compassion for Naomi. Notice, again, what she says in verse 3. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Notice that this servant girl did not, did not hate this man, Naaman, who had captured her and who had turned her into his own personal she, listen, she only saw his need. And what a lesson for Christians to learn. Listen, we can choose to hate or we can choose to love. We can choose the path of love and that's the path that she chose. And let me just say something uh, in, in, in regard to what's happening here and the, the dynamics, and that is this. This is just as much, actually more so, a racial issue here in this story as what is going on in the United States today. Make no mistake about it. There's some great race tensions taking place here. Syria and Israel were enemies. Syrians hated the Jews as a race, and it would have been easy for this servant girl to hate her Syrian captors because of the injustice that had occurred in her life. Listen, there are no greater racial tensions than that which exists in the Middle East. It has been going on for centuries upon centuries. And so the Bible isn't new to dealing with racial tensions and racial issues, and they're real. But what we need to understand is that this is part of the dynamic of what is happening here in this story. This is a, this is a story about race, if it's a story about anything. But what we learn here is that though the world may mistreat us, we have to learn to see beyond the injustice and see things, listen, through redemptive eyes. And that's how Jesus lived his life. He lived a life through redemptive eyes, listen, not revengeful eyes. And that's a decision that we all have to make. Listen, hurt people, hurt people. I want to say it again. Hurt people hurt people. And it is a cycle that unless broken will continue from one generation to another. And the way that you break the cycle of pain, 
The way that you break the cycle of hurt is to help facilitate healing in another person's life. Listen, by directing them to God, who alone is just, and who alone can heal. And this is what this servant girl does. You see, she tells Naaman's wife that God is the answer to Naaman's problems. Hallelujah. And so she had great compassion for Naaman and his suffering and his sickness. In his sin. Number two, she had a great confidence in God. Notice what she says again in verse three. She says, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. You see, she knew what God can do through his people who are surrendered to him. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. You see, she had a conviction that the power of God was greater than the power of Naaman's struggling and sin and sickness. And loved ones, if we are going to offer hope, if we are going to offer healing to a broken world, we too must share that same conviction. That God is the answer. That God can heal you. Listen. I have no confidence whatsoever that any man that any woman, that any political party, that any man-made group is going to be able to provide the solutions to the problems that exist here in the United States, let alone in the world. Amen. Sorry, I just don't. But I have every confidence that if we turn to the true and the living God, it would be the answer to all racial problems. It wouldn't be the answer to all economic problems, all environmental problems, all hunger, all political, all moral, all problems of crime and corruption, and most of all, to all the spiritual problems that have overtaken this nation and this world. Amen. And let me tell you the reason why. Because the scriptures promise us, would you say it out loud on your screen, bless is the nation whose God is the Lord. Would you say it again? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You see, that is our hope. And that is our hope alone. And let me suggest that this servant girl, as well as Elijah, represents what the church should be to the world, and that is a prophetic voice that offers hope and healing and speaks God's best over people's lives. That helps them believe in his love and his mercy and his power and his grace. Not words that flatter, but words that focus on a God who is greater than our sin and our sickness and our sorrow. This gal was promoted in the things of God because she had great compassion. She had great confidence in God. And number three, finally, she had a great confession of faith. What she said, God can heal. Goes to the prophet. He will experience healing. And guess what? She was right. She was 100% right. Notice how this lowly servant girl's faith here it is. Here's how she was promoted. This lowly servant girl's faith influenced kings, the king of Syria and the king of Israel, persuaded commanders, Naaman, and moved prophets, Elijah. That's pretty impressive, by the way. You see, great faith always accomplishes great things. And what we learn here is that one's social status should have nothing to do with one's faith status. In other words, no matter where you are at on the social scale, your faith in God can be rich, 
Your faith in God can be great. Your faith in God can be impressive. You can be someone small in the world, but a giant in the things of God. And that's the story of this servant girl who didn't leave her post, who didn't long for the things of the world, who didn't lie to cover her tracks, and didn't lose God's favor upon her life. And I love this servant girl's faith because she wasn't focused on the bigness of Naaman's problem. Nor was she focused on her own hurt and the injustice that had occurred in her life, and it was truly injustice. She was focused on the bigness and the greatness and the goodness of God. Come on, somebody. Amen. That was her focus. You see, our problems are temporary, but God is eternal. And all problems are the same size to God. Would you stand and close with me in this prayer? Thank you guys for praying me through this. <clears throat> you pray this out loud for me, with me. Let's begin. Father God, may our eyes always be on you and the things of your kingdom. Help us to guard our hearts against longing for the things of this world rather than longing for the things of God. Teach us that the passing pleasures of sin will never truly satisfy us, and that you and you alone will satisfy the longing of our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward, the elders to come forward. And if you have prayer for anything, a need for anything, we want to pray with you and for you and over you. In the name of the Lord. Perhaps today's message has spoken to you and one or more of these things that we talked about apply to your life. Maybe you've left your post. It's time to get back. It's time to get back to where God desires you to be. Perhaps you're like this character named and the, the, the leprosy of sin which leprosy starts on the inside and it works its way out and manifests itself outwardly, and if left unaddressed, it will eventually destroy somebody's life. And that's why it's likened to sin, because sin does the same thing. Hey, there's a great God of Israel. There's a great prophet in the world today. It's called the church. It should be a prophetic voice to the nations. And you can find healing in your life. You can find hope in your life, you can find help in your life, and it comes through this God, who sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him, Jesus Christ, should not perish in their sin, but should have everlasting life. Why? Because God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but that the world might have life. See, that's why he came. He wants to give you life. And if you want that life, I want to encourage you to come and somebody to pray for you. God bless you. God love you. Let's, let's uh, emulate this servant girl's life this week, shall we? Let's have great compassion on people despite the injustice that we may personally have experienced. Let us have great confidence in God. And let us have a great confession. God bless you. Thank uh -huh.
will worship your Lord. 